the Yale Center for Emotional Intelligence and professor in the Child Study Center at Yale University, Mark Brackett. I guess I'm supposed to ask you how you're feeling. Uh -huh. You may talk more about your feelings in the next 25 minutes than you have in your whole life. Can I ask everyone to just get good posture in their seats? Thank you. Just take a nice long inhale. Kind of absorb your previous experience. It's pretty good. And I'm going to start off by just asking you to check in with your feelings. This is a tool that we developed, and we call it the Mood Meter. And it's based in a lot of science. And it says that every moment of our day, we are experiencing a feeling. On the x-axis, it says the word pleasantness. So I'm going to ask you right now to think about your level of pleasantness. Minus five. You're in the worst place you've ever been. Minus three. You're kind of like most people. Everyday unhappiness. <laughs> or maybe you're a smack in the middle. You're just neutral. Um, I joke a little bit about the state that I come from now, Connecticut. We're kind of, we don't talk a lot about feeling. Maybe you're at plus three in pleasantness. Or maybe you're in plus five. Plus five would mean that you're looking at me and thinking to yourself something like, oh my goodness, I want this guy to move in. He's going to be my personal emotion coach when I wake up in the morning. My hunch from your response to that, that you're not there yet. <laughs> so just give yourself a number on the X axis. Where are you right now? Not in your life, because I can't deal with that. On the y-axis, it says energy. Energy is literally your level of activation. Plus five, you feel highly energized. Minus five, you feel highly depleted. Where are you now? And clearly, we create four quadrants, the yellow, the red, the blue, and the green. Let me get a raise of hands. How many of you are somewhere in the yellow this morning? You're high energy and pleasant. OK. How about green? Pleasant, but energy is kind of low. Anybody in the red or the blue? Can't see any hands. Let's think one. And you've now pointed that person out. <laughs> <laughs> so when we think about it, how, many, how possible is it that a room filled with, I don't know, four or 500 people, 99% of you are feeling some form of happiness? How many of you think that there's some liars in the room? <laughs> well, I'm going to show you some data that's going to prove it. But before we go there, I'm going to ask you to take a moment and think about the daily life of a student. We're at an ed tech conference. We care about kids. And I'd like you to just think for a moment for the next 30 seconds. It's 6 o'clock in the morning. You're a child. Do me a favor and actually think about a child. Maybe it's your own child, maybe it's a student if you're a teacher, maybe it's your parent or your parent. And take a moment and just become that child. Live vicariously through them for the next 30 seconds. It's 6 o'clock in the morning, you're waking up. How are you feeling? This is a silent reflection, by the way. You're commuting to school. How are you feeling? You enter your school. You look around. How do you feel? Class one, class two, class three, class four, math, science, language, arts. How are you feeling? It's now the afternoon. Tests, no tests. How are you feeling? You're leaving, going to an after school program or somewhere else. How are you feeling? It's the evening. It's dinner time. Who are you with? How are you feeling? That's been a question I've asked in a lot of my research. And what we've shown over the last couple of years is that our kids are not doing so great. This is a study of 22,000 high school students across the United States. And when we asked them, in their own words, how do you feel as a student in your school? 77% of the words they shared with us were mostly unpleasant. Tired, bored, and stressed were the top three. If you're an LGBTQ student, guess what? It's even more negative. If you're a student who has been bullied, it's even more negative. So we said, let's go to their teachers and see how they're doing. And as you can see, they're doing great. The top emotion that our nation's teachers told us they felt was frustrated. We did more advanced analyses on these data, 
And what we found was that the climate of their school was the single strongest predictor of their negative emotions. That means the quality of their relationships between and among their peers, their principal, when they were negative, they experienced more negative emotions. And on top of that, what we found was that these teachers had mental health challenges, depression, anxiety. Their BMI scores, their body mass indexes were higher in those schools. They were more likely to have sleep troubles. They were more likely to have stress-related absences. So I decided to study college students. Because my goodness, right? You get into college, you should be happy. And as you can see, they're not. And I think it's quite interesting when you ask college students or high school students, like, when I get into college, when I get into Yale, where I work, all of a sudden, like, my dreams have come true until October. And then all of a sudden, what I hear from students is things like, I'm an imposter. I've been manufactured. I'm not sure who I am. I don't know. I don't have an identity. And lo and behold, their experience of more negative emotions ensues. When I got deeper with my students and I said, well, what's the underlying theme of your negative emotions? What I found was, interestingly enough, it had nothing to do with quote unquote stress. A lot of it had to do with envy and jealousy. So I asked some of the counselors, like, what's your envy reduction program? And they said, well, we just teach mindfulness. So I was thinking about that, like I just breathe. <sighs> wow. I hate you for having so much money. <laughs> Right? Think about that. Right? Just down-regulating your negative emotions may not necessarily help you reappraise or shift your cognition around the challenges that you're facing. I think we need a broader agenda for what we need to teach our nation's youth. So we went out to the workplace and we studied 15,000 people across the United States from finance to farming. Lo and behold, we found they're pretty stressed as well. So when you go back to that mood meter, what you see is that we're emotionally out of balance. We're spending a lot of time in that red and blue and not enough time and we might say the yellow and green. Now, I'm going to be the first person to tell you that the goal is not to be yellow all the time. I'm a neurotic, Jewish, introverted professor. Like, I'm never going to be in the yellow. <laughs> it's just not my, it's not in my genes. I feel fake when I'm there. I like beg for like daily satisfaction. And I think it's a disservice, actually, to our kids who have a variety of personalities and backgrounds where we have to push them to be happy each day. Maybe our focus should be well-being or contentment. Nevertheless, we need to figure out a way to swap. We need to figure out how do we spend 20 to 30 percent of the time in that red and the blue and 70 to 80 percent of the time in that yellow and green. Because when we ask people, how do you want to feel? They tell us, they're very clear. I want to feel happy. I think people use the word happy because they don't have a very rich emotion vocabulary. Because when we pull out happy, we get a lot of interesting words when people give us their second and their third word. We start seeing that people have basic needs that are not met. Like, I want to feel respected. I want to feel valued. I want to feel supported. I want to feel like I belong. I want to feel accomplished. And the reason why we care about this is because emotions matter for five big reasons. The first is attention. Think about it. How you feel right now as my participant is driving your cognition. If you're irritated with me, you've got something wrong with you, but that's another thing. <laughs> if you're bored right now, think about it. Your brain is elsewhere. Your brain is not, not doing nothing, right? Your brain is working and it's thinking about something else that means more to you. So when we go to schools and we look at boredom, it's not a sign of the student, it's a sign of the interaction in the classroom. Engagement is the antithesis of boredom. I was a student who was terrible in school. I was an anxious kid, I had a lot of bullying problems growing up, and lo and behold, I was a C and D student. I don't know you're thinking, how is that possible? That was a joke, by the way. Um, <laughs> And the truth is, I was a pretty smart kid, but my emotion system took over my cognitive system. I was too worried about survival. I was too worried about how do I get home without getting beat up. I don't care about the Roman oligarchy or pre-calculus. The second is a decision-making. Raise your hand if you've ever made a bad decision. 
Well, what you might not know is that how you felt oftentimes drove that choice or that judgment. So we do research on teachers, for example. We've shown in experiments that good and bad moods can shift grading by one to two points. Literally, randomly assigning a teacher to write about a good day or a bad day will shift the way they evaluate a student essay. And when we ask people, do you believe that how you felt had any influence over the way you graded, what do they tell us? No way. Because we don't want to believe as a species that we don't have control. But yet, our emotions drive much of our judgments each day out of conscious awareness. The third is relationship quality. Raise your hand here if you work with someone who is difficult. Like a lot of people who are difficult. How many of you live with someone who's difficult? <laughs> I don't know about you, but I work in a place where there's entitlement, and it's, it's difficult for me oftentimes because of my blue-collar roots. I sometimes do presentations, and I have participants look at me like this. <laughs> Emotions are signals. In their purest form, they are signals to approach or avoid. So how we display our emotions on a daily basis is driving people to approach us or to avoid us. And you take that into consideration in the workplace and in schools, and you realize how important it is. The fourth is physical and mental health. Here's the data that I think will make you want to do something about this. For the last six years in Connecticut, there has been a 20% increase each year in students seeking mental health treatment in college. So every year for the last six years keeps going up 20%. If you look at national data, depression will be the leading cause of disability across the United States and the world within the next decade. So there's something that we're not doing right. The fifth is performance and creativity. Raise your hand if you value creativity. I mean, this conference is like all about creativity. What I've learned working with high school students in particular is that if they don't have the strategies to manage their feelings when they're trying to be creative, they don't achieve their dreams. Why? Because they get harsh feedback and they can't handle it. Why? Because they get disappointed in their progress, they get frustrated, they get overwhelmed. If you don't have the strategies to deal with your feelings, guess what? Oftentimes, you give up. And that leads us to the skills. In our center, which was the, uh, you were the university who founded the concept in collaboration with the University of Hampshire, the concept of emotional intelligence. And we now talk about it around five key skills. The first is recognizing emotion, picking up on those cues, both internally and externally. The second is understanding. The third is labeling. Fourth is expressing and then regulating. So let's go through them very quickly. Emotion perception picking up on the cues, face, body, voice, internally, my own physiology, my own cognition. On a scale from one to five, one being you are not very perceptive, five being you are very, you're like an emotion scientist when you're reading people. How many of you would give yourselves a four or five? You're pretty good at reading people. Okay, I'm gonna show you some data in a moment. That was a trick question, obviously. The second skill is understanding emotion. What's causing my feelings? Do I know the difference between anger and disappointment, between stress and pressure? A lot of my students say, I'm stressed, I'm stressed. But what they really are is under a tremendous amount of pressure to perform. They're under pressure from their parents to be perfect. They have the resources to do it, but they just can't get out from the pressure. What we say in our center is that you have to name it to tame it. You have to label it to regulate it. If you don't have emotion language, it's very hard to know what to do with your feelings. When you're disappointed, you have unmet expectations. When you're angry, there's a perceived injustice. The strategies that you would use to support a child to regulate those different feelings are completely different in most cases. The fourth skill is expressing emotions, knowing how and when to express emotions across context with different people, race, is a factor in whether or not we express our emotions. Gender is a factor. Power is a factor. If you are a CEO or a high-level leader, a principal in your school, you don't know things about how people feel because oftentimes they're afraid to express their true feelings. Even where I work, students do not want to tell me they're anxious because they think I will think they're weak. 
And we have rules in our nation about expressing emotions. And we think, for the most part, that negative emotions are weak. What I'm here to tell you is that they make us stronger. Finally, there's the regulation of emotion. What are the strategies that we use to manage our own emotions? And what are the, what are the strategies that we use to help other people regulate theirs? One thing that's really interesting about emotion regulation, especially in America, is that we are obsessed with self-control. Right? You gotta regulate, you gotta sit still, you have to have delayed gratification. The truth is, in our homes, in our schools, and even in our workplaces, emotions are mostly co-regulated. How your boss feels, how your colleagues feel, influences how you feel. And in turn, the regulatory process happens. So now I go back to your emotional intelligence scores. I will share with you, I was at a dinner last night, and some seemingly high net worth person came up to me and he said, oh, you're the emotional intelligence guy? I said, yeah. He goes, I made my millions because of my emotional intelligence. <laughs> <laughs> and before I, yeah, I use my regulation strategies. Um, I said, I want to share with you two forms of two research projects I worked on. The first was on the correlation between self ratings and actual skills. There's none. Uh, and the second, is that there's an interesting correlation between self-rated emotional intelligence and narcissism. <laughs> I held back. When we measure emotional intelligence as a set of skills, what we find is that students with less skills or more developed skills look like the two columns here. Pretty big differences. If you're a parent, if you're a teacher, my hunch is that you would like to have children on that right side. These are thousands of students across the world that we've studied looking at the association between more developed or highly developed emotion skills and these outcomes. When it comes to managers and leaders and principals of schools, we find over and over again, those with more developed skills, they're better leaders, they have less stress and burnout, they have greater job satisfaction, the list goes on. We've even now studied supervisors, and we've broken them into two groups. As you saw earlier, the workplace is pretty stressed out. But let's look at it when you break it down by low EI versus high EI supervisors. I'm blown away by this. That one variable, the emotion skills of a supervisor, can shift how people feel that dramatically in an, or in an organization. And by the way, these data look the same if you're at Goldman Sachs or if you're a principal of a school in Chicago. What's interesting is that, think about that, if you can read these carefully, if you have a supervisor who is high in emotional intelligence, you feel inspiration around 75% of the day. If you are working for a supervisor who has low emotional intelligence, you are only feeling inspiration around 25%. That's a big difference. I don't know about you, but that accumulation of lack or, or more inspiration each day going back to the research on how emotions drive our attention, our learning, our decision-making, our creativity. Frustration is the opposite. So then people said, well, what about it? Maybe it's just that the, the high EI supervisors are more lenient and people do whatever they want to do. Not true. This should, I'm sorry, this is actually the wrong title. This is workload. So what you're seeing here is that there's no difference in workload between low, middle, and high EI supervisors. However, with burnout, look at that. Triple the burnout. Fear of speaking up, triple. Engagement, purpose and meaning at work. So over and over again, what we're finding is that it's just better to work in an organization with leaders who have these skills. My primary work has been in school systems. Um, I've been the co-creator of an approach called Rule that's in around 2,000 schools in the United States, and we're growing in other countries like Italy, China, and Spain. And what I've learned over the last 20 years working with schools is that we got to move away from piecemeal approaches. We just got to move away from having rules and assemblies and classroom kits and simple lessons and flavors of the month. And we've got to think more about systemic change. We've got to incorporate theory into the way we embed social and emotional learning into schools. We've got to make sure what we're doing has some evidence base. We've got to train and support all stakeholders. So here's a nice theory of change to think about. 
all adults, school-wide tools, coaching and online support, where technology comes in really handy, is providing ongoing professional development, ongoing support, ongoing self-analysis. What I've learned over the years, it has to be everybody with a face. It just has to be. It's got to be leaders, it's got to be teachers, it's got to be students, it's got to be families. It's got to be support staff. In some of our best schools, it's the person who's taking attendance who is making a difference in children's lives because they're walking into school and the attendance person saying, hey, how are you feeling today? You need a strategy? What I've learned over the years is that there are four factors that really need to take, be taken into consideration. One, my hope and dream is to make everyone into an emotion scientist that people value the principles of emotion science. And let me tell you, I don't work at a place that necessarily values that. Here's one quick antidote. Gave a talk recently to a bunch of surgeons. And at the end of my presentation, one of the surgeons stood up and he said to me, what happened to academia? <laughs> and he goes, Mark, we train Nobel laureates, not nice people. <laughs> and I was like, what is going on here? And then another professor's up, he goes, what I learned, Mark, is sometimes you got to be a blank blank, because then people just shut up and do what you tell them to do. <laughs> I mean, it was like a movie. And I went over to the chair of the department, I said, like, is this for real? <laughs> and he looks at me and he goes, why do you think I asked you to come in? <laughs> so we have work to do in getting people on our Emotions Matter bus. you got to develop the skills. What I learned running around the world is that people didn't even know the skills existed. I was in therapy for 15 years of my life, and I didn't learn any strategies to regulate my feelings. I knew a lot about my relationship with my mother. <laughs> but like, I didn't have any skills. Like, ooh. You gotta work on the climate. I, the, the climate, how you feel walking around, how you feel in the faculty room matters. And then you've gotta think about your policies. You just have to think about when a child is in a classroom, for example, and maybe they misbehave, and they get sent to the dean or the principals, I'm like, how is that person managing it? How are the principles of emotional intelligence being infused into discipline? And then, what research shows is that pretty good things happen. The results that you want occur. So let me just share with you a little bit of our work. One is that we say there's too many rules, not enough feelings. Too many rules, not enough feelings. Ask people how they want to feel and then drive the climate through that lens. We say you have to name entertainment, bring in tools like the mood meter to build that language. Teach words deliberately across children's development to help them build the language, to help them build the skills around more complex emotion states. Right? Children deserve to have a rich understanding of their inner life. Teach them strategies on how to manage the full range of emotions, not just how to calm down. We gotta stop calming down. Sometimes we gotta be energized. Sometimes we wanna be angry. It's my anger at our education system that motivates me. I just have to use effective strategies. We've gotta know how emotions influence the way we think and even design lessons or technology. That different emotions are associated with a different way of processing information. And that if you do it right, you can get people more engaged. We've even developed an app we call the Moon Meter app to help people build greater self-awareness. Even schools now look at this as a middle school that did an examination of different start times and they found actually students are a lot happier when they come in a little bit later. Self-analysis using design thinking. From preschools all the way up to high schools to projects across the world, having Mood Meter Day in Mexico. Other tools are helping us to manage our emotions more effectively. We say you have to be your best possible self to really deal with your difficult emotions. So what does that self look like? How do you want to be seen? How do you want to be experienced? How do you want to be talked about in the world? And when you reach for your best self, guess what? You regulate more effectively. We have other tools, one we call the blueprint for problem solving. At the high school level, we get into more granularity around who am I? What do I want out of my life? Where am I going? What are the skills and strategies I need? For years, we've been collaborating with Facebook on a project that's student-led called Inspire Ed, where we, the students themselves come up with the projects, and they use a framework to help them assess and brainstorm and commit, and then evaluate that project to help make their school a better place. 
There's lots of things to know about. Readiness is important. We say adults first. A lot of people want to rush into the classroom. I will argue that the adults who are raising and teaching kids have to develop these skills first before we want them to do it in the classroom. Let me wrap up by saying we've done quite good research on this. Experiments show these skills matter. I've now co-founded a company called OG Life Lab that is designed to bring emotional intelligence to the workplace because running around the world, adults are saying, how do I develop these skills? Managers and companies are asking, how do I have a pathway for developing the ruler skills? And the big question, I think, for people in the room is, is my product, is my social media site incorporating design that integrates emotional intelligence and developmental science to promote well-being and pro-social behavior? What are those core principles? Are you teaching the skills? Are you depleting the skills? And I'll wrap up by saying, emotions matter. Emotional intelligence is real, I promise you. There are creative ways to do this work. It's never too early. It's never too late. We know from research that people who have these skills are healthier and happier. And maybe, just maybe, if we take this work seriously, our children's dreams will come true. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you.